adventure connecting our lives to help us survive so we spend our time to the fullest we can hi welcome to professional insights my name is laurie share and i am on the advisory board for dementia action alliance Today, I have the privilege of interviewing attorney Rosemary Hal Buell. Rosemary is a partner with the firm of Buell, Little, Linwood, and Harris, PLC, and practices in the areas of elder law, long-term care planning, estate planning, special needs planning, and estate and trust administration. Her entire professional career has been devoted to working with senior citizens prior to becoming an attorney. She worked in a variety of settings, assisting seniors and their families with the complexities of long-term care. Rosemary brings her extensive experience, practical knowledge, and compassion to every meeting, looking for the best solution for every client. Rosemary, thank you so much for being here. Thank you very much for having me, Lori. I appreciate being here. Well, it's a, it's a joy, and we really do appreciate the time that you're donating to help people living with dementia and their care partners. We want to get into, of course, elder law practices, because that's what you do. Um, and we have so many questions. First off, Okay, I've been diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's and FTD, frontotemporal degeneration. Is it too late to put an estate plan in place if I already have a diagnosis? And if so, what, what's the time frame for completing this whole process? Lori, that's a, that's a great question to start with. Um, a lot of times when people are faced with that type of diagnosis, they're immediately in a state of panic. And I often remind people that a diagnosis itself doesn't equal to legal incapacity. A diagnosis means that they've identified what the person's problems are. And now, now you have to tackle what you can do knowing having that information. So if a person has received a diagnosis, you have to dig deeper than that. As I said, a diagnosis itself isn't enough. The real question is whether or not the individual is able to understand what types of things are being suggested. Does the person understand the, their financial situation? Do they understand who their family members are? Do they have a good feeling about just their, their business matters in general. Now, I realize that some people may not get a diagnosis until later in later stages for a variety of reasons. So there may be people that once they finally have an actual diagnosis, it may be too late. However, I feel like for the vast majority of people who are recognizing signs earlier on, a diagnosis is just really a call to action particularly in the legal world. Um, if a person has um, received a diagnosis, it's really important that pretty soon after that diagnosis that they seek out legal advice to make sure that the right supports are in place to make sure that they are taken care of, that their family or loved ones are able to be able to act on their behalf. And so during a person's lifetime, um, we, we really encourage them to, to reach out, get a hold of an attorney um, in, their, in their state, because this is very state specific at times, and to start that conversation to make sure that they are meeting the standards that are needed in their state. But essentially a diagnosis does not mean that they're unable to do it. For most, uh, most attorneys, when you meet with them, there'll be a, a consultation where you will discuss what's going on, and then the attorney will talk to you about how long it'll take to put those kind of, that kind of paperwork in order. I know that it's pretty common to have that done within about a month, I would say. Again, there's you know, times that it can be a lot faster than that as well. Dude, that's, that's a good amount of information there, but you talked about being competent. At what point am I not considered competent to make this decision? And 
who, who determines that? That's a really good question, Lori. Being able to, as we'd say in the legal world, execute documents or to have legal capacity is actually a decision that is made legally. Um, you're, it may have some input from medical professionals in terms of where, where they see you, what types of things you're able to do, but really it comes down to you meeting with an attorney who would discuss this with you. The standards are gonna be a little bit different from state to state, just to be very upfront with you about that. But I think it's very fair to say that my experience has been that there's a gut feeling of, does this person understand at, at a certain level what we're talking about? Do they understand, I have a bank account with ABC Bank. They may not know the exact balance, but they know they have a bank account. Do they understand they have money coming in? Do they understand who would be their trusted people that they would want to act on their behalf? Do they understand that they could sign a document that would let that person act on their behalf? Those are the general kind of practical questions that you ask. Sometimes when we're dealing with individuals with a diagnosis, we do take extra steps to have certain medical um, evaluations done. But typically, it's more of a, it's more of a um, judgment call on behalf of the lawyer. Now, sometimes, unfortunately, this slips into um, not every family gets along. And so sometimes the um, courts get involved. And that's when there's a lot more medical documentation and testimony that kind of comes into play. But if you're just meeting, you know, one on one with a lawyer, the lawyer is going to talk to you about what your situation is and, and try to get a feeling for whether or not you really have a grasp of what's going on. So again, it's going to vary a little bit state to state. Um, and hopefully you don't have to get courts involved. The sooner you get your ducks in a row, so to speak, the less likely you are to need to get the courts involved for that. Well, okay. And what are some of the basic um, estate planning that I need to do during my lifetime. I mean, okay, so I'm still competent, I think. Um, I'm still competent enough to make some of my decisions, but what do I absolutely have to have to make sure myself and my family are, are covered appropriately without having to cause family squabbles so that I make the decision? That's, a, that's again, a really good question. The basic documents that people should have in place during their lifetime are the durable power of attorney for financial, and then its counterpart, which I'll call the durable power of attorney for health care. Now, again, I'm licensed here in Michigan, where it's snowy and cold outside today. That may not be everybody who's watching this, this experience. So you'll want to make sure to touch base with an attorney in your community. I know this is very important because in our office, we have two attorneys who are also licensed in Florida. And there is a big difference between the documents our clients that are in Florida need as opposed to what our Michigan clients need. So you want to make sure that you have the right thing in place for your community. The financial power of attorney, I'll start with that one. It's pretty easy to understand the concept. You have named an individual to someone else to help you out, to act on your behalf, and to handle your financial matters. Now, the document itself, it really depends on what your state needs. Here in Michigan, we have certain things that have to be in a document in order for that person to be able to do some transactions on your behalf. So for example, here in Michigan, if you want your, we call it your agent, the person you've named in your power of attorney, if you want your agent to be able to give gifts of your money to other people, you have to specifically put that in the document. That's just one example. Now, that's not something that I would necessarily encourage you to do, but sometimes that type of planning is helpful and having that ability is, can be very helpful depending on how your, your finances are handled down the road. 
However, in Michigan, unless you have that authority, you can't do it. And that agent, their hands are tied. So, you know, I've, I've had people come in with, you know, one page documents that they found from their neighbor's cousin, sister or whatever. And, and I understand where they're coming from. But, you know, when you have a diagnosis like that, it's really critical to get exactly the right documents in place so that you know your needs are taken care of during the ability that you're the time that you're able to make these decisions and then also at times when you are unable to participate in the conversations so again I, this is a, this is a good thing for financial now the financial power of attorney there's a couple different ways that you can do that um, some of them are what we call springing, which means that you have to have two doctors certify that you are unable to act, and that's when the power of attorney goes into effect. Um, here in Michigan, we prefer them to not be springing, which means that they go into effect automatically. We like the idea of a power of attorney for financial to go into effect immediately because that allows the individual to be working with the person they've named to have as much involvement as they can and to have a smooth transition. Sometimes I have clients that express concerns saying, well, I don't want them to get into my my financial situation. I don't know that I trust them to do that. And that in my mind is a big red flag. If you don't trust someone to be involved in your financial matters while you are able to see what they're doing, you should not be trusting them after you're able, after you're no longer able to look out yourself for yourself as well. Um, again, the financial power of attorney is very, very important. And we've learned over time that more companies are picky about whether or not it says you can deal with life insurance or health insurance or has, does it talk about specific stocks or beneficiary designations? We have found that our power of attorney has gotten longer and longer over time, which is, I know, frustrating, but it comes in handy when I'm wrangling on the phone a couple years later with an insurance company trying to find out the cash value or whether we can take a loan against a life insurance and I'm able to point out that paragraph that specifically talks about that. The, um, the power of attorney I do runs actually close to 12 to 13 pages, which is a little overwhelming for some people wow. that, come in, that come in for a couple paragraphs, come in with one that's pretty short. The um, companion or other document would be the healthcare power of attorney. This power of attorney is also very important, and it's called different things in different communities. In Michigan, we designate what's called a patient advocate. That is the individual that'll make decisions on your behalf medically. In Michigan, we designate this individual, and they act at the time that you are unable to act. So unlike the financial power of attorney, the health care power of attorney is springing and that's by just how Michigan works. Um, the importance of both of these documents is really putting the time and effort into communicating your wishes, making sure you have the right person named for each of those roles, um, and making sure you have the right documents in place for where you live. As I mentioned a minute ago, we, I'm practiced primarily in Michigan. Um, my colleagues that practice in Florida have an entire series of different documents that need to be executed to make sure that those people that live in Florida have the right situation in place. Um, the other things I like to just talk about briefly is who to name. Um, you probably don't want to just name your oldest child because they're your oldest child, even though I see that all the time. Um, if your oldest child can't make those tough medical decisions, they're probably not the one to ask to be in that role. Um, if you do decide that you have someone in mind, you want to talk to that person about that role to make sure that they are comfortable taking on that responsibility and also make sure that they understand what your wishes would be. Um, knowing that a lot of times that decision just has to be an, an in the moment decision um, if they're having to make medical decisions on your behalf. So really during your lifetime, the two big ones that we focus on to make sure you're taken care of are your financial and healthcare power of attorney. 
And Rosemary, what happens if I don't make these preparations? And we're, we're getting a little short on time, so I'm sorry to throw one more question at you, but I think this is important to know. Okay. That is important to know. So I just explained the two basic documents that, that I recommend really for anyone, but particularly for people that are struggling with some sort of dementia diagnosis, the healthcare and financial power of attorney. So your question really gets to the heart of, well, what if I don't do it? Or what if my loved one did not do it? And unfortunately, their disease has progressed to the point where they really don't have a grasp on these types of concepts anymore. That's when your local court will become involved. Again, this is going to, going to be a very state by state determination, but the general concept is that there's a guardianship process out there. The terminology might be a little bit different state to state, but essentially the court would need to get involved. Your family may need to actually petition the court to have someone legally appointed to be your guardian. In some, in some communities, they refer to the person in charge of financial matters to be a conservator. But the idea is that they, that individual now has to account to the court. They have to legally account to probably your immediate family members. There's a lot more oversight and probably a lot more cost. It's not necessarily the end of the world. And I've actually found in some circumstances that having that court oversight can be really helpful if there's a family that's maybe not all on the same page because then the court or the court's representatives are able to do some investigation also just so that everybody is being communicated to in, in the best way. So really that's where you would head to is you know, heading to court to, unfortunately, if someone legally put in charge of your affairs. Which I'm sure can be a very pricey and long process. Yeah, unfortunately, uh, it's, it's really interesting that people really are hesitant to come see a lawyer because of cost, which I completely understand, but at the same time, not seeing a lawyer and having to go into the court system is going to cost a lot more, absolutely. Well, Rosemary, I wanna thank you so much for your time and for coming in. And, and speaking with us today. Thank you very much for having me. It's really great to participate with an organization like yours. You're really looking to help your members out a lot. I'm glad I could be a part of it. Thanks. Well, again, my name is Laurie Scher from Dementia Action Alliance. And today we were interviewing attorney Rosemary Howley Buell. And again, thank you for the time. This is the Dementia Action Alliance Professional Insights Podcast. If you like our podcast, please subscribe to our YouTube channel and by all means, spread it around on your social media so we can help other people. Thank you all and just have a great day. Connecting our lives to help us survive So we spend our time to the fullest we can We're seeing our lives have purpose Engaging our days